Now, innovation, um, it's a key theme of today's conference, and it's got quite a role to play in keeping um, the seafood sector sustainable and economically resilient. And we're going to hear some examples later on um, from, from my co-speakers. But for my talk, I'll touch on why innovation is important for keeping this year's outlook on track. So on a global scale, um, seafood production's trending up, and that's in line with growing um, global demand. Most of the additional um, demand is being met by um, a growing aquaculture sector. And this figure shows us that globally wild-caught fisheries that may have reached a sustainable limit in terms of production at around 90 million tonnes, um, at least from the early 19, um, 1990s. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organisation indicates that aquaculture now contributes around 40% of global consumption, and from the figure we can see that share is going to rise over the medium term. So growth in um, seafood consumption stems from two main drivers. The obvious one is growing global population, and that's pushing seafood naturally up. But I think more importantly for the Australia's industry is a recognition that um, Incomes per person are sort of increasing in significant markets that, markets that we export to, and, and that's causing a per person consumption increase of seafood. So if we look at a breakdown by region, we can see that most of the consumption's occurring in um, developing Asia. That's where most of the growth is going to come from going forward. And that's um, particularly true for seafood. Now China, um, it's a really a key market for, for Australia. And it's the, actually the world's largest consumer of seafood. And it's anticipated in that market alone that the number of households is going to reach 271 million additional urban households by 2022. Now, that's a big number, but you've got to consider that that's an extra 97 million more households than they had in 2012. And what history tells us is that as incomes rise, the demand for quality is also going to increase. Now, we're all aware that Australia has built quite a reputation around supplying premium seafood and is quite well positioned to benefit from the consumption growth in the Asian market, and in particular the China region. But there's other competitors out there, so we should be mindful of that, and so we need to continue to focus on innovation, and that's very important, important because, particularly because when it comes to seafood, um, we're, we're a trading nation. So this brings me to prices. Given that we are a trading nation. What happens in world markets matters. And it's been pretty good for the last few years um, for, com uh, for our commodities. And Rock Lobster's beach price, if you look at that figure, has been somewhat turbocharged. Other commodities have, fare have fared pretty well also in recent times. So the driver there has been strong demand for seafood in the East Asia region, combined with a readjustment um, in Australia's exchange rate from near parity a few years ago to around 75 cents currently. Over the outlook period, we heard this morning that our exchange rate is assumed to remain on average around 75 cents to the US dollar. So naturally, we, we'd expect some moderation in um, um, growth in real beach prices um, going forward. So that's why it sort of flattens out, out a little bit. And you've got to also take into account these are real prices, so it takes into account the effect of inflation. But for some wild caught products, um, for example, rock lobster, um, you can see that the trend is bucked. And that strong Asian demand is, is, is going to keep supplying, uh, well, keep causing that price to increase somewhat. This contrasts with tuna, um, where despite global supply being relatively constrained for that product, weakness in Japan's economy, that's anticipated to have a, a, a negative effect on um, tuna pro tri pro beach prices going forward. For aquaculture, um, a global increase in production, that's anticipated to lead to softer world prices for um, some of our aquaculture produced commodities, and that's going to transmit to local beach prices here. But of course, um, prices is not the whole story. Um, production also matters. So combining um, the price story with um, ABS forecast of production volumes, we get this picture in um, trend in gross value of fisheries and aquaculture production. Now, exciting for the industry is that um, it's hit three, the three billion dollar mark in 1516, and that's a level of gross value that the industry hasn't seen since the early 2000s. 
Now this high point, that's mostly the, the result of high production volumes from um, salmonids in recent years, and um, also the prawn sector hasn't been get, doing too badly as well, and higher world prices for rock lobster. So while we have um, GV, um, gross value of fisheries production um, projected to decline um, slightly um, in the next few years to around 2.9 billion by 21-22, the story remains largely positive for the sector. There's a few commodities that provide the bulk of production value, so rock lobster, salmonids, tuna, prawns and abalone together, they continue, um, they, they account for over 70% of Australia's fisheries and aquaculture gross value of production. If we look at it from a sector perspective, um, there's been two large movers there, rock lobster and salmonids. Globally, lobster is virtually all wild caught, so that constrains a little bit um, from, well, from the supply perspective, it, it's a bit constrained in terms of what the, the sector can supply in response to high demand. So most of the high prices that we're seeing is actually a, a demand push effect from um, growing demand in East Asia for the product. Now there is some potential for volume increase from Australia, but it's not a lot. So a few years ago there was some um, perilous settlement issues in the Western rock lobster industry. A lot of that's sort of resolving. So. There is some, some potential, but as I said, not a lot. So what's going to drive the increase um, in production value for this species going forward in the next few years is, is the projected increase in world um, prices for lobster. For salmonids, um, the story is a little bit more, more complex there. In response to recent global supply shortages, um, there were some disease outbreak issues in farms in Chile and Norway for different reasons, but that's that, um, that constrained um, uh, international supply of salmon for a few years and we saw the salmon price um, spike up um, quite a bit in the last couple of years. Um, not some of that's abating now, um, production is coming slowly back online and so as that um, builds a bit of momentum over the medium term, prices will be naturally come under a bit of um, um, pressure. On the supply side, um, Australia's production of salmonids is projected to continue to grow, but a little bit more modestly than what we've seen in the past, and, it, and probably not enough um, to offset the negative impact of those lower prices on the overall value of the sector. Um, salmonids earlier this year, and even I guess even now, is having some negative media exposure in relation to production in environmentally sensitive areas in Tasmania. And so it's anticipated there'll be some um, short-term readjustment in, in the industry of, of, in terms of production um, quantities, but over the longer term, there's plenty of potential in that sector for further expansion. For prawns, the recent incursion of white spot disease into Queensland has caused some short-term disruption um, to the market. So several um, farms, seven um, in fact, in the southeast of Queensland have been um, negatively affected by the disease with um, um, total destocking of the farms um, necessitated by that. Um, now aquaculture prawn, prawn production in Australia contributes around 5,000 of tonnes annually. That's tw around 20% of total prawn production. And the farms affected in the southeast, they only produce a small portion of that. But in a sense, it's still a little bit uncertain as to the wider effects of the disease, and so that's still being worked out in terms of what, what um, collateral effects the disease might have and recovery from the disease um, um, going forward. But like salmon, over the long longer term, there's plenty of um, production plans in the pipeline for aquaculture prawns, and over the longer term, I think we'll see that prawn aquaculture sector growing quite significantly. And that will be sort of a topic of future outlooks. For this outlook, however, ABS is forecasting prawn prices are going to ease a little bit over the outlook period. Um, that's despite the, um, the white prawn um, um, disease and that sort of thing. And that's largely a result of recovery from the impact of a disease which, which has hit the, the wider sort of international markets in the last few years, which constrained international supply more than domestic supply. So that's going to drive a slightly lower production value uh, for prawns in, over the medium term. For other commodities, um, they're going to remain on a fairly steady path in terms of production value, um, some increases, some declines. 
Um, for example, ABARES um, projects some slight growth in gross value of production of abalone, but slow, slightly lower production for tuna. So I highlighted before the importance of, um, of key commodities to the production value and the importance of trade to the, to the sector. And the same commodity sets, um, rock lobster, salmonids, tuna, prawns and abalone, as I said, they contributed 70% of production, but they contribute 90% of edible seafood export earnings, and by value, um, we export over half our production value annually. So that, this highlights that trade is very important to the sector's growth strategy, uh, especially in a period when we're not going to get much gains in terms of lower exchange rates. We're assuming st exchange rates are fairly stable over, over um, the next few years. So this contrasts in the period um, where we had 50 cents to the dollar in the early 2000s to near parity in, in more recent times. And you can see the effect of that change in the figure had on, um, eco, um, on gross value pr fishery production, that trend downward trend in the first few years of that graph. So, but moving forward, which is the focus to, of today, um, there are at least two positive things that are sustaining this year's outlook uh, for, for seafood exports, and which, which we should highlight. Firstly, that global seed food demand is rising, and in regions that we have a, tra a strong trade interest in and a trade focus in for seafood, that's particularly the East Asian region. And secondly, the, the recent trade agreements um, um, with China, Korea and Japan, Japan, and the Minister made mention of these this morning, they're providing a boost to our local seafood products as tariff levels are progressively ratchet, ratcheted down for um, products that, that we export to those regions. Over half our fish exports are sent to the Vietnam, China, Hong Kong region. Um, that's a big change on a decade ago when Ch Japan was our major export destination in terms of value. And so the rise in incomes in the East Asian developing um, region in recent years has been the main driver for that. And it's meant that there's been a, a switch in seafood export orientation, if you like. Continued growth in those economies and tariff reductions under Australia's free trade agreements, that's going to continue to provide support for, for demand over the medium term. And we anticipate the total export value to remain um, broadly unchanged um, in real terms over the outlook period at around $1.5 billion in $16, $17. So the change in market composition that we saw in the previous figure has also led to some reorientation in the export mix away from tuna and prawns um, toward rock lobster. Now, tuna and prawns, um, they, they were exported, well, they, they still are, but they were exported mainly to Japan back when Japan was a, quite an important market. So a little bat, bit of that has, has abated in, in, in recent times, and we've changed our orientation to exporting um, rock lobster and um, sort of products that, that the East Asian region likes. So the, the, the shift, I guess there's been a shift in, in, in the demand, demand centre for seafood products in that area of the world. So in many respects, um, tuna and prawns, they've been affected by the burgeoning um, global aquaculture sector in, in the last um, 20 or so years, which has provided competition um, for these sectors, and that explains some of that, that shift that's occurring. So for tuna, it's been the rise of, of um, aquaculture tuna in the Mediterranean and in Mexico, which has provided competition for Australian tuna in Japan, and for prawns, it's been competition that has come from strong growth in prawn aquaculture production in East Asia. And we see some of that competition in our own domestic market when we go to the supermarket. You see a lot of prawns, um, imported prawns even today. So in contrast, rock lobster has grown to dominate export earnings. Um, that's largely a result of growth in the East Asian markets um, where the product is highly sought. Um, and that's also true for, for, for abalone. It's um, uh, quite a demand centre for that as well. Rock lobster exports are set to grow to account for around half of all fisheries and aquaculture export value by 21-22. Given this outlook, um, how can innovation help? So when it comes to seafood, Australia doesn't ha have a problem in selling its product. We have quite a unique product um, that the market really wants and desires. For example, we're the world's largest producer of wild-caught um, abalone and rock lobster. We're able to provide highly prized 
um, sashimi grade bluefin tuna to Japan for the sashimi market. Now wild caught prawns, are, they're pretty unique. They're, they're large, they're striped and whatever. And they're sought both here and abroad for their taste, size and other culinary attributes. However, we're somewhat limited when it comes to volume growth and that's because we run our fisheries quite sustainably. And this is where the innovation comes in. Future value growth is likely to be driven by price rather than volume. Most of our wild caught fisheries, as I said, are fully developed. So aquaculture's got a little bit of potential, um, but the investment needs to be right in the right place and needs to be sensitive um, in terms of its environmental, broader environmental impacts. So the industry's proven what it takes when it comes to innovation. So just a few examples I'll give you. So as Australia has built a reputation for its ability to export live product to the lucrative Asian market. Now that takes a lot. You've got to take a product from the sea in a live state and you've got to deliver it at the other end and it's got to look in a fairly pristine and healthy live state. So you can imagine all the logistics that goes in, 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 into that process. Um, so that's, that's not easy. Likewise, Australia's salmon eaten farm tuna industry, that's rapidly expanded over um, the last two decades. And for, for farm salmonids, um, the industry saw an opportunity to boost Australia's consumption of, of salmonid product um, from quite a bit below one kilogram per person in the early 1990s. Um, they're hitting around 2.6 kilograms per person now. So they're really bringing salmon to, to, the, to the table. For tuna, it's largely been a story of value adding to wild caught product to make it ready and um, suitable for Japan's tight specifications demanded in the sashimi market there. For the wild caught sector, um, there's plenty of examples, and I'll pick one from the Commonwealth Fisheries, a, somewhat, a fish I'm somewhat familiar with. So prawn trawling there in the northern pra Commonwealth nor northern prawn fisheries has become more efficient in recent times with the adoption of quad gear technology. That's four nets in tow rather than one big net covering the, covering the same swept area. So now for the northern prawn fishery, um, the prawn fleet's able to land the same catch with far fewer boats than that, what they did 20 years ago. And recent developments that sticking with that fishery in the terms on the bycatch front are also quite encouraging where a new innovative net design is um, dramatically re reducing the bycatch from that fishery. So, but there's other areas to mention also. So there's marketing campaigns such as the Love Australia Prawns campaign, which is giving a, some sort of price premium to prawn, to prawn um, sales and producers would attest to this. The Air Peninsula Australia Seafood Frontier campaign, which is presenting um, seafood from that particular part of, a, part of Australia in, in a very nice way. And recent technological advances in the area of online seafood marketing, which is increasing the availability to se of, of, of seafood to people that may, may not have necessarily had good access in, in the past. So plenty of examples there, and I look forward to hearing examples from um, the panel members later on on seaweed, seaweed pippies and abalone. However, we should remember that Innovation only comes when property rights are secure and the resource remains valuable. So Australia's got a good track record in regard to its fisheries management and this is an area that we need to um, maintain if innovation is to continue. So to summarise this presentation, here are the key messages. The outlook for fisheries and the aquaculture sector remains positive, far more positive than when I presented here a few years ago when we were facing high fuel prices, constrained la labour market because of a mining um, boom sec uh, booming mining sector and a high, facing the highest trade line near, near parity. So most of the growth over the outlook period is going to be continued by supported high, um, will be supported by high price received for rock lobster exports and continued salmonid production growth, even though it's going to be a little bit lower than we've had in the last few years. And other commodities will also play a part in, in that story. Asia will remain our key export destination for seafood and the, tree f and the free trade agreements um, we've recently made with Korea, China and Japan are all, all assisting. On innovation, it's important to maintain a keen focus on it. It's the lifeblood of the industry. Innovation is the only way to grow value when um, supply is relatively fixed. It also links back strong to productivity and profitability. So many examples of um, innovative of an innovative sector already exists, but we should remember that the world's not standing still in this regard, and our competitors are also looking to produce more with less. Thank you.